Happy Easter, church. Let's worship the Lord together.
Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing this morning? Hey, happy Easter. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh Murray. I'm the pastor here at Canyon Creek, and I just want to welcome you uh, here this morning as we gather together to worship Jesus and celebrate his resurrection. Hey, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to ask you to do me a favor during our service day and fill out our Connect card. Uh, there's a few ways you can do this. You can scan that QR code there on the screen behind me or send us a text. Our phone number's there. Or if you picked up a paper bulletin on your way in, you can tear out the card in there and drop it in the plates as you leave today. We just want to get some information from you uh, because we have some information that we would love to get into your hands. So please do us a favor and fill that out. Uh, but before we move on, I want us to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to start reading in verse 1. It says this, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. The Bible says there was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. This is the part I want us to pay attention to. Verse 5, the angel tells the women, don't be afraid, because I know you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. The Bible says he is not here, for he has risen just as he said. And I love this invitation. The angel says, come and see the place where he lay. And this is the invitation that I want to give to you this morning as well. My prayer for us today is that we would come and see, that we would come and see the risen Jesus. See, everybody thought that Jesus was dead. Everybody thought that the movement was over. Everybody thought that the miracles were over, that the stories he told and the sermons he taught were over. This thing that they had given their entire lives to was over over. Jesus was dead. And so was their hope. So was their faith. So was their hope for a new way of life, right? That's what they thought. But the movement that they thought was over was really just beginning. And that's the beautiful thing about the resurrection of Jesus is that it doesn't just end with him. His resurrection turned a bunch of sad and dejected followers into passionate missionaries who would go and give their lives, sharing and spreading the name and the love of Jesus. His resurrection resurrected their dreams and their hope and their lives as well. And he does the same for us too. So as we gather here this morning, I wanna encourage you to come and see. Come and see this risen Jesus because he's not where we thought he was. He is alive this morning. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much. For Jesus, we thank you that the tomb is empty still to this day, that as we gather and worship you today, that Jesus, his presence is here in our midst. Father, we pray that that resurrection life would rest on us today and that we wouldn't miss it. The hope of new life right here and right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen.
down the gates of hell with just one breath. No other king will reign until the end. Jesus, no one is like you, oh my Jesus. No one beside you, of this I am convinced. No greater love exists. Jesus, no one is like you. Jesus, no one beside you, of this I am convinced. No greater love exists. Forever all my hope is in. Forever all my hope is in. No other king. 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 Can we celebrate Jesus this morning, church? Let's give Jesus a round of applause for the miracle that he did. And we're going to sing a new song together on Easter Sunday, but this is just such an anthem that I've really enjoyed for, um, for myself, and I, I wanted to share it with you. Because of Jesus, we have this new identity. The old is gone, the new is here, we're a new creation in Christ, and this is what this next song is all about. So uh, let's sing it together. It's called Made From More. of salvation was only the start now I am chosen free and forgiven I have a future it's worth Oh 
celebrate Jesus' resurrection this morning. We celebrate the new life that we have because of it, Father. And God, we just give you all the glory, the honor, the power for forever and forever. Amen. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome again to Canyon Creek. Happy Easter. I'm so honored to have you here with us as we celebrate the resurrection. I also want to take a second and welcome those who are joining us online from home today for our live stream service. We're glad uh, that you're here. But I want to start this morning with a question. That question is this. What is Easter really all about? All right. Maybe you would say it's about the adorable Easter bunnies. All right, we have a picture here for you. This is the one that was safe enough to show in church, by the way. If you Google terrifying Easter bunnies, there's a whole section of the internet devoted just to this. But I agree with their expressions. I think that's reasonable. Maybe you would say it's about the adorable family photos. All right? This, this plan was not fully hatched. All right? But they're adorable, aren't they? Great idea. If this is your family, I'm sorry for showing this in church today. Maybe you would say it's about dying eggs. That's a tradition. These are potatoes, though, because eggs are really expensive. So uh, we're dying potatoes this year. Now, I think we would all agree that if Easter is about the bunnies and the pictures and the eggs, it would be understandable if that left us feeling a little bit empty, right? Right? The truth is, though, even if we know the meaning of Easter, once we get over the hype of the weekend and get back to Monday, if we're really honest, we too perhaps feel a little bit empty, all right? Just to be very clear, it's my conviction that Easter is all about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, if Christ has not been raised Our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Now, when we read this verse, it seems a little bit brash, doesn't it? But Paul, what he's saying is true. He's saying, if this thing did not happen, your preaching does not matter. If this thing did not happen, your faith does not matter. Bible studies do not matter. The building does not matter. Mission trips do not matter. It's all useless if Christ was not raised from the dead, all right? Apart from the resurrection, I would argue that there is no Savior. Apart from the resurrection, I would argue that there is no salvation. There is no forgiveness of sins. There is no hope for eternal life. Here's the truth. Apart from the resurrection, Jesus was a very interesting but very dead man. All right? So is it possible that so many of us have missed what Easter is really all about? And I get it. Sometimes in life, we have a hard time with the truth, don't we? For me, this area is McDonald's. Don't judge me. I know it's a bad choice. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I love McDonald's, all right? It's not Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is my favorite, but I still love it. In fact, almost every time someone sees me eating McDonald's, they're like, do you know like, what that really is? And I'm like, yeah, I do, but it's delicious. Um, I don't want that truth to impact my life. And a lot of us are that way with Jesus, We like a certain version of Jesus that we're comfortable with, right? Maybe for some of you, that's the Jesus is my homeboy, Jesus. Maybe for some of you, that's the Jesus who floats everywhere he goes, wearing a bathrobe. We really love the picture of Jesus that we're the most comfortable with. Maybe for you, it's a Jesus that doesn't really care about all of the things that we are so fired up about. Maybe for you, it's a hateful Jesus, right? Maybe it's a version of Jesus who is constantly an aggressor. Maybe it's a version of Jesus who is constantly pointing out how wrong and bad everybody is. What is your version 
of Jesus. I've said this before, that you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when he hates all the same people you do. So what is your version of Jesus? It's very easy for us to simply want to adopt our own truth about who Jesus is, right? If you think about the TV show American Idol, the whole reason why American Idol was ever successful is because there are a lot of people who really believe that they can sing, right? Even though they can't. And that's what makes the show great. That is the entire reason for its early success. It was because people believed deep down in their hearts that they could sing, but they couldn't. And our beliefs are a lot like this. A lot of our beliefs are based on desire, not on what is actually true. And this just isn't a Christian problem, by the way. This is a human problem, right? We do what we believe to be true. People may not always have the strength to live what they profess, but they always live what they believe. And it's one thing to profess a belief system, but it's an entirely a different thing to actually live as if that belief system were true. So if you're here this morning and you don't believe in Jesus, it's almost impossible to ignore the fact that Jesus was massively significant, all right? He was born to a teenage virgin. He worked as a peasant carpenter. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the small rural town he was born in, all right? He never published a book. He never ran a company. He never had any children. He spent the first 30 years of his life living in obscurity, and he died at the age of 33, just three years older than I am now, and yet no one has transformed the world more. His wake is the largest legacy in the history of the world. More songs have been sung more paintings have been painted, more books have been written about Jesus than any other person in all of history, okay? If that wasn't enough, time is literally defined by his life. When Jesus came into the world, our time switched from B.C. to A.D. B.C. stands for before Christ, and A.D. stands for Anno Domini, or the year of our Lord. Time literally hinges on this man. History literally hinges on this man. So even if you don't believe in him, it's almost impossible to ignore the fact that he was massively significant. But again, apart from the resurrection, Jesus was a very interesting but very dead man. All right? If you were to come to me today and give me all the reasons why you don't believe in Jesus, here's how I would probably respond. My guess is, if you told me all the reasons why you don't buy into this whole Jesus thing, I would probably say, yeah, I get that. If you told me about the ways Christians have treated you, or the way power was manipulated in the church, or the abuse that took place, or the things that were overlooked, I would probably say, yes, I get that. If you gave me one shot to try to get you to even consider Jesus, here's what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't defend the history of the church, all right? There were some very, very dark seasons in the history of the church, not just like a Sunday here or there, by the way, like entire periods, right? I wouldn't defend things that other Christians have done to you. If you gave me one opportunity to invite you to consider Jesus, it would be the event that we celebrate today, his resurrection, all right? That's where I would start. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, the people in Jerusalem and Judea did exactly what we would do if we saw someone rise from the dead, right? Think about that for a minute. The disciples watched Jesus die. They watched him go into a tomb, and then they had breakfast with him a few days later. And then they did exactly what we would do if that happened to us, right? They told everyone about it. They wrote books about it. If you witnessed the resurrection of a person, would that story ever have to be coerced out of you at a dinner party? No, right? They talked about it. They shared it. They wrote about it. So I would argue that we can believe that the resurrection really happened because real people witnessed it. And they talked about it. And they wrote about it. And most importantly of all, they believed it. All right? In Scripture, we have four accounts of the resurrection. We have Matthew, who was an eyewitness and believed it. We have Mark, who got his information from Peter, who was an eyewitness and believed it. We have Luke, who was a doctor 
who interviewed eyewitnesses and believed it. And we have John, who was a close friend of Jesus and an eyewitness who believed it. Think about James, for example. James is the brother of Jesus. What would your brother have to do to convince you that he was God? Okay. My guess is that there would not be a list long enough of things that your brother would have to do to convince you that he was God. In fact, we know that prior to the resurrection, James didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't believe that his brother Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't believe that his brother Jesus was the Son of God. But after the resurrection, he didn't just become a believer. He became one of the greatest leaders in the early church. James, who didn't believe in Jesus after he witnessed the resurrection, died as a martyr for his faith. So today, at the very least, I want to invite you to consider the resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to dive into scripture, but I want to give you a little context. Israel, God's people, believed that God was going to send a Messiah to return Israel to glory. But year after year, decade after decade, century after century, there was nothing. There was no Messiah. And in this first century, Israel was under the rule of the Romans. And this really interesting rabbi named Jesus of Nazareth arrives on the scene, and he began to preach with authority. He began to do things that seemed a little bit bizarre. He taught in parables. He pulled coins out of the mouths of fish. It was really strange stuff. But crowds gathered around him, which threatened the authorities. Eventually, Jesus raises a man named Lazarus from the dead, and that was the final straw. And I often wonder, what would it have been like to have a front row seat to this? What would it have been like to be an eyewitness to this? Can you imagine spending three years traveling with Jesus, eating with Jesus, laughing with Jesus, crying with Jesus, listening to him teach, watching him perform miracles, all the while Jesus is telling his disciples this is eventually going to come to an end. And it did, just as Jesus said it would. So this rabbi, Jesus, he's betrayed by a close friend. And then he's condemned in the temple. He's crucified by the emperor. He dies on a cross. His body is prepared for burial. And then he's sealed in a tomb. And in that moment, the disciples were empty. Everybody say empty. They were empty. They were hopeless. It was game over. There was no message worth writing down. There was nothing worth talking about. There was no hope to hold on to. There was no movement to keep alive. At that point, the one that they had put all of their faith and their hope in was now dead and sealed in a tomb. They were expecting a conquering hero, and instead they had a crucified friend. They were expecting a, a king claiming victory, and instead he was in a cold, borrowed tomb. They were expecting to celebrate triumph together, and instead, they were mourning his death. All of their expectations were dead in a tomb. Can you imagine how empty they must have felt? Put yourself in their shoes, right? Put yourself in their story. Maybe you had just allowed yourself to believe again, and now Jesus is dead in a tomb. Maybe you've had an experience like that in your life. You've finally allowed yourself to believe in this Jesus again, and now he's dead in a tomb. You finally allowed yourself to hope again, and now Jesus is dead in the tomb. You finally allowed yourself to love and be loved again, and now he's dead in the tomb, right? They're feeling empty. And we all know what it's like to feel empty, right? And there at that time was no countdown timer outside the tomb. None of these eyewitnesses wrote as themselves as heroes. None of the gospel writers said anything like, everyone doubted except for me. They were all empty, they were all devastated. But the story doesn't end there, which brings us to Sunday. This is how it begins. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. The Bible says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. Now we're going to stop right here for a second, because it's worth mentioning that the first people that came to the tomb were women. All right? Now, women in the day that we're reading about had a low status, to say the least. Their testimony was not even considered to be admissible evidence in court. So if you were making up a story about the resurrection of Jesus, you would not send women to be the first eyewitnesses because that would undermine the plausibility of the entire story. The only reason 
that we know that women were the first eyewitnesses. The only reason we should believe that is if they really were. Now, why did these women bring spices to the tomb? Okay. Let me just tell you, they weren't anticipating a resurrection. It wasn't because Jesus really liked spicy food. They brought spices to anoint his dead body. It was something they did out of reverence and respect. In other words, they were fully expecting to find a body in the tomb. They were fully expecting the tomb to be full. And what did they find? Verse 2 says, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. The tomb was empty. I don't want this to pass us too quickly. What must this have been like? The 2,000-pound stone has somehow been rolled away. They didn't know where the guard was. Everyone expected to be anointing a dead body, but Jesus wasn't there. Verse 4, while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified, just as we would be, and they bowed down to the ground. Here's this question. Why are you looking for the living among the dead. This question has been haunting me all week, and here's the reason why. How often do we look for life in dead places? How many times do we go to sources other than Jesus to find meaning and purpose and love and peace? How often do we look for life in dead places? I think of biblical scholars who study the words of Jesus in their original language, but don't actually believe in the resurrection. I think of archaeologists who 2,000 years later are still looking for the bones in the tomb, but they're coming up empty. I think of people who wear crosses around their necks or have them tattooed on their bodies, but don't actually abide in Christ. These people all have one thing in common. They're looking for Jesus among the dead. They're looking for life in dead places. They're looking to be filled by empty spaces. And we do the exact same thing. We're all guilty of looking for life in dead places. It could be success. It could be your career. It could be your work. It could be a dead religion. It could be dead power. It could be dead ambition. It could be wealth. It could be status. It could be people thinking well of you. My guess is a lot of us have sought these things. My guess is that a lot of us have searched for life in dead places, and it leaves us feeling empty. So I want to ask you today, what is empty in your life this morning? Is it an empty stomach? Is it an empty bank account? Is it an empty bed, an empty bottle, an empty heart, an empty soul? What is empty in your life today? If you're at a place where you're feeling empty, let me just tell you, God's not going to waste your pain. All right, He doesn't do that. He's going to use it. He's going to form you. He's going to grow you. He's going to turn it into something beautiful because God loves you. Not some future version of you. He loves you right where you are today, even as you look for life in dead places. And you, my friend, are not the exception. We find the victory in the next verse. The angels tell the women at the tomb in verse 6, He is not here, but He has risen. Remember how He spoke to you when He was still in Galilee, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered His words. This is what Easter is all about. It's not about the bunny. It's not about the eggs or the candy or the family pictures or the potatoes that we died. It's about the fact that Jesus Christ conquered sin and death and that he rose from the grave and is alive today. You will not find Jesus among the dead because he is not there. And he offers that same new life to us. It's not about a prayer we pray so that we can go to heaven when we die. It's about resurrection life right here and right now. And here's what this looks like, all right? When bitterness and anger consume us, when we yearn for revenge toward those we've hurt us, we trust Jesus when he says this, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
when the challenges of life are absolutely crushing us, when we feel like we can't make it another day, we trust Jesus when he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. When the news fills us with anger and anxiety and worry and fear, we trust Jesus when he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. When we struggle to find meaning and purpose, we trust Jesus when he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. When we grieve the loss of a loved one, we trust Jesus when he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And when we shudder in the face of our own mortality, we trust the risen Jesus when he says, I am the resurrection and the life and the one who believes in me, even when he dies, will live. Easter means that nothing is impossible with God, that love triumphs over death, that love triumphs over hatred, that hope triumphs over despair, that suffering does not have the last word, all because of the empty tomb. To put it very plainly, the empty tomb means that you don't have to live an empty life. That's it. The empty tomb is good news, not just for the future, not just for eternity in heaven. It's good news for us right here and right now. Jesus is not just the doorway to eternal life when this life is over. He is the doorway to resurrection possibilities right here and right now. Salvation, it's not just for someday, it's for today. So as we celebrate the most significant event in all of human history, the moment that God who came to our earth took our place on the cross, and when he did that, he was thinking of you, okay? There is hope in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus, and I wanna invite you to call on his name today. If you've never known Jesus, today is the day. Easter is not just a celebration of a lavish afterlife. It is the inauguration of new life, new creation, new possibilities, new faith, new hope right here and right now. We are no longer bound by sin. We are no longer desperately searching for things to fill our emptiness. We no longer need to spend our time looking for life in dead places. My friends, what if yesterday was your last day living in B.C.? Let's pray together this morning. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, that today still the tomb is empty and that Jesus is alive. I know that there are people here who have heard this story for years but maybe have struggled to believe that it's actually true. I know that there are people here who are hearing this story for the very first time. God, we thank you that wherever we are in our journey with you, that you meet us right where we are. We thank you, Father, that you love us right in the midst of wherever we find ourselves today. And for those of us who are feeling empty, for those of us who spend our time going to all sorts of different wells, hoping that they'll satisfy us, would today be the day, God, that we stop looking for life in dead places? Would today be the day, God, that we opt out of the rat race of life only to find life in you alone? We thank you for the empty tomb and for the resurrection. With heads bowed and eyes closed for just another moment, maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching online and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. His resurrection means that we can find forgiveness and salvation in a relationship with him because God sent him to this world and he lived a perfect life and he died a sinner's death on a cross. He was buried in a tomb, but he came out of it alive three days later so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could have a relationship with God, so that we could spend eternity in heaven with him. So if that's you today, you wanna place your faith and your trust in Jesus, I just wanna encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Church, let's make this our prayer together all over this place this morning. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm asking you to forgive me today. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and that you rose from the dead so that I could be saved. So today I turn away from my sin and I invite you to come into my heart and into my life so that I can know you and trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. I give it all to you today. 
In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Let's stand and worship him together.
Amen. Y'all grab a seat. Grab a seat. Grab a seat. I won't keep you long. I won't keep you long. Uh, it looks like Josh dressed up for Easter. I dressed for the Lido deck. I figured that out when I got here today. Uh, if you are a guest today, we would love for you to connect with us. That is like the bare minimum we ask of you. That would be so great. It does help us serve you better, helps us equip you better, and we, we live to serve here at Canyon Creek. So you can scan that QR code there on the screen behind me or text the word guest uh, to that number on the screen behind me, 844 844- 3070536. If you grab the bulletin on the way in, there's a tear-out sheet in there. You still have time to fill that out as you exit today and drop it in the offering plate on your way out. Please do that for us. We would love to serve you better. Uh, talking about connecting and different ways to do that, if you are interested in learning more about who we are here at Canyon Creek and also learning a little bit more about yourself and how best you can serve the kingdom, uh, we are so excited to have a Next Steps event coming up on Sunday, April 14th. That's directly after service. Lunch will be provided. It's a really great time. I don't want to call it like a new member's class because school is boring. This is actually a lot of fun, and you should definitely participate in it. If you'd like to participate, you can sign up by texting the word STEPS to that same number on the screen behind me, or you can RSVP uh, in the foyer on paper if you'd like to do that as well. Really do want to serve you that way as well. We are super excited to have that event Sunday, April 14th. Uh, Kids, where are the kids at? I know you're in here. Kids. They're all sleeping. Uh, we have a scavenger hunt, so wake up. Uh, we got a scavenger hunt immediately here in just a second. It's for the kids, not the adults, for the kids. Uh, so if you would like to participate in that scavenger hunt, get your parents and go over to the kids' building uh, across the courtyard, and we will do that here in just a second. So after I pray, uh, go. All right. Uh, with that, if you need prayer, we're going to have prayer partners up here in the front. They're here to serve you and pray for whatever you need, and they're blessed to do that. So if you need prayer, they're here for you in just a second. Uh, and as we exit today, uh, we have offering plates at each uh, door as you exit today. If you'd like to give and build the kingdom that way, that's there for you. We've got a debit credit kiosk in the foyer if you'd like to give with the card, and we have a portal on our website at creekfamily.org forward slash give. Lots of ways to stay faithful to building the kingdom together. We appreciate y'all who do that with us and for us. Uh, With nothing else to say, let's stand. We will pray and we will dismiss this Easter Sunday. Father God, we are so thankful. We are thankful for the cross, but more importantly, Father, we are thankful for the empty tomb and what that means, the new life we now have because of a resurrected Savior. Father, I pray that as we go from this place, the weight of that truth would carry with us with our steps into our workplaces, into our schools, into our homes, wherever we go. Father, help us to be a light uh, to the places we go. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Happy Easter.